Free speech is one of our most cherished human rights. But these protesters have become an obstacle to free speech by blocking access to an event featuring a conservative speaker. You don't have to agree, but you have to have that right to say it. This is a university, it's a school of thought, so it's, um, even if you don't agree, you need to listen. More than anywhere else in America, a college campus should be the safest place to express different ideas, beliefs, and points of view. Universities are supposed to be a place where students can get together and engage in debates and exchange ideas. Uh, that's why they're referred to as the marketplace of ideas. At least that's what members of the Young Americans for Freedom thought last February, when the club planned a free speech event on the California State University Los Angeles campus with conservative speaker Ben Shapiro. He's very intellectual and he's really good at arguing and debating and so I thought he could change some of the minds of students here at Cal State LA. To my knowledge, to what I've known so far on, on the research that I've done, there has never been a conservative speaker here on campus. And reactions from liberals on campus? What got to me the most is how mean and vicious they were against people who didn't believe the way they, they thought. They were all like, oh, we believe we're open-minded, we're tolerant, and then when you find out someone who doesn't think the way you think, they call them like racist, sexist, homophobic. Despite hostile reaction, the students decided free speech was worth the effort. The university attempted to impose security fees on the event because they said it was controversial. And then they attempted to cancel the event. And on the day of the event, they allowed a mob to block access and prohibit students from attending the event. Protesters were allowed to lock arms and block the entrances, creating a serious safety risk, despite assurances of a safe and secure environment from the administration and the presence of campus police. Come on! Come on! Come on! Block this shit off! Block this shit off! Hey! If you guys, you know what? If you guys really want to see it, this is on the internet being streamed live. But the point is, you ain't going in through that door. While the mob was chanting no violence, they were pushing and assaulting those who wanted access to the event. People pushed me down and I was shoved and elbowed multiple times. Those guys, they were punching, they were all in front of the door. Meanwhile, campus police did little to clear the way for students that wanted to enter the auditorium. Some people were being prohibited from getting inside because of the crowd, yes. So what kind of crowd, what kind of control are you exerting over the crowd to let the people... We're not who want to come in? exerting any control over the crowd. How come? Because it's not a safety issue at this point. The most shocking thing to me was the amount of unlawful and violent behavior that the university allowed the protesters to engage in. And they allowed them to stop the students from engaging in their First Amendment rights and just be able to attend Ben's speech. With the mob blocking the doors from the outside, campus police made an announcement. The, the auditorium is full. No, it's not. You can see here that it's not. I'm telling you, that we, we were told by his folks that, the, that it's full and that he's the speech has already begun. This is video of Ben Shapiro starting his speech to a rather empty auditorium. The waves of students that you see entering right now are being sneaked in because in America in 2016, you have to use the back door if you want to participate in free speech. You get to block the front door if you're a member of the left. But the pro-freedom students pressed on, determined that the event would take place despite attempts by the mob, which included some faculty, to shut it down. The professors and other faculty members of the university were actively participating in organizing, encouraging students, and then participating in stopping students from attending this free speech event. And those who did get in weren't allowed to leave immediately after Shapiro's speech. I have been told by campus police that it is literally a threat to life and limb to go out there. I've, told that, I've been told that they can't personally guarantee my security or any of your securities if you go out there right now. I was very scared. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, it was extremely dangerous, extremely scary. For the students who were so determined to exercise their First Amendment rights, they've decided to stand up to those who tried to silence them. Alliance Defending Freedom and the plaintiffs have filed this lawsuit to send a message to the university that you can't impose fees on speech that they think is controversial. And you can't allow a mob to shut down speech just because the mob disagrees with it. We don't want the university to perform illegal actions against us or canceling our event just behind everyone's backs. We don't want the university to break the First Amendment just to silence us. Good evening. Welcome to tonight's discussion, Freedom's Marketplace, how undermining free speech undermines education. My name is Carrie Kupak and I'm the Communications Director and Legal Counsel at Alliance Defending Freedom. 
Alliance Defending Freedom is one of the world's largest uh, legal organizations devoted to defending civil liberties, which for many years has included advocating for free speech and academic freedom on college and university campuses. I chose to begin our conversation tonight with a video highlighting the Ben Shapiro Cal State LA situation that happened last year. Just for some background, in case some of you are not aware of what happened there, the Young Americans for Freedom Student Club scheduled the popular radio host and editor of Daily Wire, Ben Shapiro, to give a presentation on freedom of speech and diversity at Cal State LA as part of an event co-sponsored by the Young Americans Foundation. University officials first attempted to shut down the event by charging the group for security and then canceled Shapiro's appearance altogether. When those efforts failed and the event was able to proceed, Professors helped incite a mob of protesters to block entry to the venue where Shapiro was speaking. And by the way, this included a professor challenging students to a fight via his Facebook page. It's interesting. And in case you will be talking a little bit more about that later. Uh, thankfully, in light of the lawsuit we filed against Cal State LA, uh, on behalf of the student organizations and Ben Shapiro, uh, they recently dropped several of its discriminatory speech policies and practices. But as anyone knows who has been following the news, this situation simply reflects a disturbing trend of anti-free speech sentiment, and really anti-freedom sentiment, that appears to particularly be on the rise across the nation today. Middlebury, Berkeley, these are just some examples that come to mind. And really, it's not just anti-free speech. We are seeing anti-Semitism increase on campus, specifically the suppression of Jewish students' freedom of speech and assembly. We are also seeing university officials consistently engage in discrimination against students in their campus clubs who hold pro-life views. Now I'm a New Yorker, and I attended the most diverse school in the country, and that was CUNY Queens College right across the river. And I'll be honest with you, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around all of this. Now, I will tell you, I was the only conservative in my political science program at Queens College, or at least the only vocal one. And I would have appreciated some backup here and there, but it didn't happen that much. Uh, and, you know, it was, it was tiring at times. It was hostile sometimes. But I can tell you I never was fearful about expressing my opinions, or that if I did, it would incite violence. And sadly, that just doesn't seem to be the case anymore. In fact, ADF, Alliance Defending Freedom, we are actually suing my alma mater. Uh, and the student we are representing is here in the audience tonight. And we're suing the school because uh, they have some discriminatory practices towards uh, recognizing student clubs. But the question for tonight and for all of us is why? Why is this happening? For how long has it been going on? What is the balance that must be struck if we want to continue to enjoy the freedom that we all cherish as Americans, whether we are college students or not? Unfortunately, we do not have to think through this alone. To guide and help us work us through these issues tonight are a panel of experts who have been in the free speech and academic freedom business for quite some time. There will be a time for Q&A with the panelists at the end, so be thinking about what you would like to discuss. And if you are joining us on Facebook Live at Alliance Defending Freedom's page, we want to hear your thoughts as well. So please send your questions, and hopefully we'll be able to include some of them. Our first panelist tonight is Casey Maddox. Casey is Senior Counsel and Director of the Center for Academic Freedom with Alliance Defending Freedom. Casey joined ADF in 2009, litigating cases to protect the rights of students, faculty, and staff at public colleges and universities across the nation. As director of ADF Center for Academic Freedom, he leads a team of attorneys that is one of the most active groups of litigators defending First Amendment rights on public uh, university campuses. Prior to ADF, Casey litigated university free speech issues with the Christian Legal Society Center for Law and Religious Freedom, where he served from 2004 to 2009. Casey has testified before House committees of Congress on a variety of First Amendment issues. He's had numerous media appearances, and his work has been featured um, in a number of media outlets. But what he really wants you to know, what he really wants you to do, is follow him on Twitter. Right. Casey is very active on Twitter, and he's very proud of his blue check mark. Are you going to that right now, or do you want to play that? In fact, we're starting to meet him now, he'd probably be thrilled. Um, Casey earned his JD from Boston College Law School in 2001. He clerked for the Alabama Supreme Court, and he's a member of a number of bars. Our next panelist is Mark Oppenheimer. Uh, Mark wrote the Beliefs column for the New York Times from 2010 until the summer of 2016, and he is now a contributing opinion writer for the Los Angeles Times. 
On his weekly podcast, Unorthodox, produced by Tablet Magazine, he delivers the news of the Jews to the world and interviews guests, Jewish and non, from Roxane Gay to Simon Dunan, from Transparence, Catherine Hahn to Dan Savage. His magazine journalism reviews appear in the Times Magazine, Harper's, The Atlantic, The Nation, The Believer, and elsewhere. He holds a PhD in religion from Yale and has taught at Yale, Stanford, Wesleyan, Boston College, Elsley, and NYU. Mark is the author of two cutting-edge studies of religion and, pop and popular culture. The first, Knocking on Heaven's Door, described how the tumult of the 1960s affected Protestants, Catholics, and Jews in America. The second, 13 in a Day, tells the story of Mark's cross-country trip in search of unique bar and bar mitzvahs. Mm, I like that. From the Ozark Mountains to rural Louisiana to Alaska. His third book, Weisenheimer, is about his years as a high school debater. He has won numerous awards for his writing and scholarship, including the Height Prize, the Corey Young um, Writer on Jewish Themes Award, the Connecticut Book Award, and the John Addison Porter Prize from Yale University. Our next panelist is Peter Berkowitz, who is a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. Peter is the Tad and Diane Taub Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University, as I just mentioned. In addition, he serves as Dean of Students for the Hurtog Political Studies Program and for the Public Interest Fellowship in Washington, D.C., and teaches for the Tikva Fund in the United States and in Israel. He studies and writes about, among other things, constitutional government, conservatism, conservatism and progressive, wow, I'm botching this, progressivism in the United States, liberal education, national security and law, and Middle East politics. He is the author of Constitutional Conservatism, Liberty, Self-Government, and Political Moderation, Israel and the Struggle Over the International Laws of War, and a number of other books. In addition, he is a contributor at Real Clear Politics and has written hundreds and hundreds of articles and essays and reviews on a variety of subjects. He is the recent 2017 winner of the Bradley Prize and holds a JD and PhD in Political Science from Yale University an MA in philosophy from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and a BA in English literature from Swarthmore College. David French is the final panelist on this panel before we introduce our moderator. And David is a senior fellow at National Review Institute. He's a senior writer there as well. He's an attorney, concentrating his practice in constitutional law and the law of armed conflict, and a veteran of Operation Iraqi Freedom. He is the author of, and, or co-author of several books, including most recently the number one New York Times bestseller, Rise of ISIS, A Front We Can't Ignore. You may also remember David from a little thing called the presidential election. <laughs> I believe David was Bill Crystal's choice for uh, president of the United States. This close to the presidency. <laughs> this close. <laughs> He is a graduate of Harvard Law School, the past president of the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education, most commonly known as FIRE, and a former lecturer at Cornell Law School. He served as senior counsel for the American Center for Law and Justice and the Alliance Defending Freedom. You should know that David was also Casey's mentor, uh, which is so it's really neat to have them both up here. Uh, and uh, to top it all off, he was awarded the Bronze Star for his military service. Our moderator. Our moderator for tonight, Felicia Finley. She is an editorial writer for the Wall Street Journal, where she covers education, immigration, state and local government, labor and environmental regulation and technology, among other issues. She joined the journal in 2009 after graduating from Stanford University with a bachelor's degree in American studies. She previously wrote columns for the Orange County Register. Would you join me in welcoming our panel? I should probably add, a, I'm an expert uh, frozen yogurt swirler. Um, <laughs> a claim to fame. Um, so I just want to introduce a uh, quote, Soviet dissident uh, Nathan Trotsky, who some of you may be familiar with, uh, famously declared that the test of a free society is the ability to express opinions in the town square without fear of reprisal, in which case many colleges probably rank as free as so former Soviet countries. Uh, restrictions on speech, whether imposed by students, faculty, or administrators, chills debate and dialogue. This has a detrimental effect on students' education and arguably intellectual growth. 
Uh, many of you are also probably familiar with the University of Chicago, uh, which recently adopted a statement affirming uh, freedom of expression, which some other colleges have adopted. It holds that the university's fundamental commitment is to the principle that debate or deliberation may not be suppressed because the ideas put forth are thought by some, or even by most, of members of the commu university community to be offensive, unwise, immoral, or wrong-headed. It is for the individual members of the university community, not for the university as an institution, to make those judgments for themselves and to act on those judgments, not by seeking to suppress speech, but by openly and vigorously contesting the ideas that they oppose. Uh, dude, although members of the university community are free to criticize and contest the views expressed on campus, and to criticize and contest who are, are invited to express their views, they may not obstruct or otherwise interfere with the freedom of others to express the views they reject or even look. <coughs> I think if you ask a lot of college students nowadays what the biggest threat to a free society is, society is an assaulting Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> but I would probably argue that a much greater threat is the intolerance we're seeing today on campuses, um, as well as in echo chambers and in social media. Like, argument, like markets, arguments and ideas are made more robust by competition, and regulations that restrict speech will diminish intellectual rigor. Uh, five years ago, President Obama you know, caused a little uproar when he said that America has gotten soft. He meant economically complacent. But I think it's worth raising the question amid the discussion of safe spaces and trigger warnings whether colleges and students are becoming intellectually soft and what that effect will have on political institutions over time. So I just wanted to open up uh, to our panel uh, some. Uh, general questions and then maybe points in particular questions at each of you uh, based on what you've covered and written about in the past. Um, so I was wondering what uh, what kinds of free speech threats uh, are you seeing today or what are the biggest ones and how do they differ than those 20 or 30 years ago? Well, having, I haven't quite litigated 20 or 30 years. Um, David may be able to speak more to that uh, to the uh, length of time. but. You know, I think what I've seen over the last 15 years that I've been litigating university free speech issues um, is a couple things. First of all, 15 years ago, we had to make the affirmative case to the public that there was a free speech problem on campus. Uh, we had the, the case, actually David litigated a case against Georgia Tech uh, 10 years ago, and even conservative commentators at the time were saying, uh, were basically wanting to blame the students. It was their problem. They were the ones who were creating the controversy, and things were relatively fine otherwise. Um, and that was, you know, over. I think by the time of the uh, the end of that case, the tide was beginning to turn. I think for Ruth and, and Arif Malhotra, uh, Ruth Malhotra and, and Arif Squar at Georgia Tech. Um, but over the last 10, 15 years, uh, I think we've we've seen a change in that people are no longer denying that there's a free speech problem. Now, part of that is because we've gone from bad policies to people almost literally trying to burn the campus down to prevent uh, someone they don't want to. Uh, to speak from speaking on campus. It's a little hard to deny at this point. And so very few people are denying anymore that there's a problem to be addressed. Um, the roots of it and exactly what to do is, the, is kind of where we are now. Um, but I think, you know, we still see the bad policies. Um, I think what we are seeing now is the, uh, the actual application of those policies and students uh, demanding the application of those policies to silence views that they disagree with. It's gone from being a, uh, an administration-driven, we don't want uh, you know, opposing views. Well, first of all, we want control, and we don't want to have certain types of views expressed here. And it's become much more uh, students themselves grabbing those tools of power that administrators have given them and trying to use those to try to silence views they don't want to hear. Yes. Me? Okay. Uh, well, I'd like to, to thank, thank you for having me here on this panel. I really appreciate it. Um, and it's a, a pleasure to meet several people whose work I've read uh, over the years, uh, but none of whom I've ever met. So it's, it's really an honor um, to be here. I'd like to say, I'm going to answer your question by way of giving a little bit of history as I see this question. And um, I teach undergraduates. Um, so and, and so I, and I actually, once I know who's going to be on this panel, I 
I asked them about this question. Um, and, but I'm often in conversation with them, and I have lunch with them frequently, and I'm pretty close to a lot of them. And so, um, so I've, I've asked questions like this: How do you feel free speech is treated on campus? Do you feel it's free? Um, and I think they're I think they're pretty frank with me. So, um, so, but I want to get this get at it a little bit this way by saying, first of all, as somebody who's really horrified any time that um, that speech is is squelched. Um, I have been particularly horrified in the last few months at what I've seen go on, go on at Middlebury College, uh, at Claremont McKenna College to a lesser extent at Wellesley, uh, where it was more things that were said rather than anything that was done. And there are other examples. And you, you, if you're here, it's probably because you know about them and care about them. Um, and what we've seen in, in 2016, 2017 so far is a lot of speech that's been suppressed uh, by students, roughly speaking, from the left of speakers who roughly, although often inac inaccurately or unfairly, are characterized as being on the right, when in fact those terms, I think, don't aren't really useful for this debate so much. But that's broadly speaking uh, how it's gone down. I think these things are somewhat cyclical, and uh, and I think that if what we want is to cultivate in young people and in ourselves, I hope, a really robust love of being offended, right? <laughs> if we want a really robust love of encountering people who think something different from what we think and therefore make us a little bit uncomfortable and therefore either move our own views a little bit or refine the ways that we can defend our own views, right? Either change them or make us better uh, explicators of them. If that's what we want, then we really have to look at how to empower young people to do that and how we've empowered and alter alternately disempowered them historically, right? Um, I tend to agree with most of my conservative friends that um, you know, trying to engineer change from above, from the administrative or faculty level, you've probably already lost, right? So when you're trying to when you're trying to use apparatuses of the state or the administrative uh, community to make undergraduates more receptive, you've probably already lost. In other words, it would have been nice if the police had been more forceful in getting Ben Shapiro an audience, but in a sense, that that was already a, a, they'd already lost, free speech had already lost there, right? Where does this go back to? Well. Everything goes back to forever. But in, you know, in my own studies as a historian of the 20th century, a very important book, of course, is William F. Buckley's God and Man at Yale, which was a very deliberate attempt to stigmatize certain kinds of speech on campus. Right? It came out in 1951, and it essentially, it's, it's, much, it's on a lot of your bookshelves. I don't know how many of you have read it, but I've read it five times. And essentially, it had two arguments. One is that Yale econom economists are socialists. The other is that Yale religions, religious studies professor are atheists. Okay, he said the students are being taught socialism in economics and atheism in religion, both of which were roughly speaking true. He exaggerated a little bit, but roughly speaking was true. And basically he said, the university needs to stop tenuring these people, throw them out where possible, defund them where possible, and the alumni have to withhold money until changes are made. In other words, he very strongly wanted to engineer the, the university away from where students wanted it to be, back towards a more conservative, free market, and Christian approach. I mean, he had absolutely no interest in the university as a place of unbridled free speech. He wanted it to be a place that raised up Christian pro-market citizens, right? Now, that had, as we know, a huge influence. It was stigmatized at the time, but he was right, by the way, about the Yale faculty. And then in the 60s, the pendulum swung back a little bit, and it was, um, it was left-wing students who were complaining about where the university had gone, and they said it had been corporatized, and it was in bed with the, the war-making machine of the Johnson administration, which in many cases it was. And then they were often arrested for, uh, for the speeches that they gave and the, the protests that they had. And then, of course, things swing back a little bit in the 80s, and people see uh, you know, that, that liberals are in power. And you know, these things swing back and forth. Who's getting stigmatized on campuses? And, and right now, we're unquestionably in a moment where conservatives are being stigmatized. Um, FIRE, of course, maintains the best resource for this, which is the database of disinvited speakers. And if you go back to 2000 or so, it's about half, maybe a little less, but about half uh, liberal speakers who are disinvited. Um, you know, Mr. Rogers was one of the first speakers on the database. I actually went through it today. I mean, you know, Old Dominion University tried to disinvite Mr. Rogers, who was a liberal, a uh, liberal Presbyterian minister. And there's always the Catholic schools trying to disinvite people who have a record of being pro-choice. Stanford tried to disinvite the radical leftist lawyer, Lynn Stewart. Uh, you know, you can go on and on. Cal State San Marcos succeeded in disinviting Michael Moore. 
Then, of course, you have the state legislatures which get, which get involved. And when they get involved, it's almost always conservative state legislatures trying to squelch liberal speakers on campus. So you have the University of Oklahoma being investigated by its own state legislature for having allowed Richard Dawkins, who believes in natural selection, you know, an evolutionary theorist, to speak. So these things are, depending on which time slice you look at it and how you frame it, you will see the problem differently. I think the problem right now is that liberals are not being tolerant enough of conservative speakers. I'm the first to say that. Um, Christian colleges, of course, write, they, they write it right into their charters that they, not all of them, but many of them, write right in that they don't want certain kinds of speakers on campuses. And that, of course, is a huge problem for the intellectual development of those students. Huge problem. I am somebody who believes all of us should do our best to attend schools, support schools, send our children to schools, teach at schools, where the idea is that we should all be encountering people who discomfort us in some way, shape, or form. And my sense is that very few people are really upholding that end. My conservative friends don't raise a hue and cry with, uh, over schools that, that disinvite liberal speakers. Um, Anti-Israel speakers, for example, on the left, um, Fordham University recently said that a student group that supported Palestine, uh, SJP, could not have any sort of school funding. These things are never the state apparatus, right? It's never throwing people in jail. It's always who gets money for funding, who gets an auditorium, that sort of thing. Um, but I think all of us have to say, how did our alma mater, how are our alma maters, the schools we support, really encouraging students to be constantly discomforting themselves in all directions? And I think most of us are failing on that task. Thanks, Peter. Uh, I want to approach the, the question by, uh, by contrasting two opinions today. First, uh, first a story, opinions about freedom of speech. A little more than three months ago, I was in Palo Alto conducting a conversation with uh, your successor, Greg, Greg Lukianoff, now pre current president of the uh, FIRE Foundation for Individual Rights in Education. Actually, it was on February 1st, the, uh, the same evening that Milo Yiannopoulos was uh, prevented by violent thugs from speaking at Berkeley. Toward the end of the conversation, uh, this public conversation, a gentleman with a pained look on his face raised his hand. We called on him, and Greg had been holding forth, answering questions in defense of freedom of speech, eloquently as usual. And the gentleman, with pain in his voice, very sincerely said, I'm with you guys. I cherish freedom of speech, too. But I gotta ask you, what do you guys have to offer for blacks, women, Hispanics, gays, lesbians, queers, transgender, and all the others who've been excluded, marginalized, and oppressed over the years. What have you, what have you guys got to offer them? I, for one, didn't know whether to laugh or cry, but our answer was a simple answer. What we had to offer them was nothing more and nothing less than all the rights and all the opportunities and all the responsibilities of freedom of speech, the right to develop your opinions, to express them just as forcefully and frequently as you can muster, the opportunity to hear other people's opinions, to sharpen your own opinion by hearing others, and the responsibility not to violate other people's opinions, other people's expression of their opinions. I regret to say that this is not the majority opinion on our campuses. And we're not talking just a, a matter of cycles. There's a reason that's not the majority opinion. That's a minority opinion. It's because a very different view dominates on our campuses. What is that view? Well, that view was recently forcefully restated uh, in the pages of the New York Times by, the, by Ulrich Baer, who is vice provost for faculty arts, humanities, and diversity at New York University. Uh, and also a professor of comparative literature. His op lengthy op-ed a couple weeks ago, I think, was called uh, What the Snowflakes Get Right About Free Speech. It turns out, from the point of view of Vice Provost there, they get just about everything right about free speech. He contends that if, I quote now, views invalidate the humanity of some people, then they restrict speech as a public good. A bear purports to argue not against freedom of speech, but in favor of a more sophisticated vision of freedom of speech. He writes, uh, the parameters of public speech must be continually redrawn to accommodate those who previously had no standing. 
but don't be fooled. Bear is abusing language. In the guise of protecting free speech, he is justifying the regulation, the curtailment, the policing of free speech. He wants to restrict speech to opinions that are acceptable, to students who are taught to be easily offended by their easily offended uh, professors and university administrators. This is a disaster for education. What needs to change? What needs to change, what needs to happen, is we have to recover an understanding of liberal education. Liberal education is more necessary in a liberal democracy than anywhere else. Why? Because we, more than any other kind of regime, depend on an informed citizenry, a citizenry that is capable of weighing the issues, thinking independently, and tolerating a diversity of opinion. That's the central mission of liberal education. To accomplish its mission, liberal education has to expose students to the widest variety of moral and political opinions. This, of course, means opinions that some people think are wrong, some people passionately think are wrong, some people think are offensive, and some people think are true, but painfully so. Only by doing this do we make progress in understanding ourselves, understanding others, and understanding the world around us. And such progress is crucial to our dignity as free men and women and to our responsibility to preserve freedom. So um, I'm going to back up a little bit. I'm going to talk about uh, the culture of campus. And I'm going to give you, um, you've heard of fake news, right? So I'm going to give you some fake math. All right, it's a, really a fake math equation. Um, and it is this. LGP equals I squared. What on earth does that mean? LGP stands for the Law of Group Polarization. Anyone in here heard of the Law of Group Polarization? <laughs> okay, I knew you would, Mark. Uh, law of Group Polarization, for those of you who are all but one or not familiar with this, essentially holds this, that when people of, a like, of like mind gather, the common expression of their shared values tends to move towards the extreme. So, for example, if Mark and I uh, are gun nuts, which I am, I don't know if Mark is, we get together and we're talking about our AR-15s, uh, we're going to end that conversation being more dedicated to our weaponry than when we started. <laughs> because we're mutually reinforcing our point of view, we're encouraging each other. And so what, the dynamic that is occurring often on campus is you're beginning to see the law of group polarization taking hold on a large scale across multiple disciplines where particularly at the faculty ranks and much of the administrative ranks, even in many of the ranks of students, there is essentially uh, the, the diversity of debate is within one side of the political spectrum. You'll have entire academic disciplines where the ratio of conservative, of liberal to conservative is 30 to 1, say, or faculties where, uh, particularly in the humanities, and Jonathan Haidt from New York University has been particularly good in pointing this out, that sociologists, psychologists, uh, and other in, uh, people in other disciplines will rarely interact in particular with a social conservative ever, ever. So what does this mean? It means that the common expression of the shared view tends to get more extreme. So that's LGP. So that equals I squared. What is I squared? Ignorance and intolerance. Ignorance and intolerance. A community of like-minded people tends not to seek out alternative points of view. It tends not to even try to understand alternative points of view. It tends to sometimes not even know of the existence of coherent, thoughtful critiques of their shared ideology. So there's your ignorance. One of the things that stunned me, I went from a small Christian school in Nashville, Tennessee to Harvard Law School. and um, I, When I went to, to Harvard, I was really looking forward to that experience. I couldn't wait to get on that campus and to debate, engage in real debate, because at my college, 
like we had that one atheist in class and everybody like couldn't wait to talk to them because that was the only person we knew that you know denied the resurrection of Jesus what I got to talk to you about this so number one I'm going to try to convert you and if I can't convert you then we're going to talk about why you're so wrong and uh, and so I couldn't wait to get to Harvard Law School where I was going to encounter real debate and real disagreement. I got there in the early 1990s when GQ magazine wrote a memorable piece called Beirut on the Charles. And this was in a time when Beirut was basically like Fallujah is today. Um, that the ideological conflict was so vicious. I can remember making just a, a, a casual point about conservatism. I mean, just normal standard conservative stuff in class and being booed and hissed and shouted down in class. I remember writing a letter to the students expressing a pro-life point of view and getting responses back like, why don't you go die, you effing fascist. Now, they weren't death threats, okay? They were death aspirations. <laughs> I'm not, they didn't want to kill me, they just wanted somebody to do it. And so, so what, it, what that was was the intolerance. Because they couldn't, they had, they had not been exposed to my point of view, they were fully invested in their own point of view, and they couldn't see the value in any kind of opposition. I presented nothing but downside. If someone listened to me and my ravings, that would mean one less person committed to social justice. If that, someone listened to me and my ravings, that would mean one less person committed to, uh, you know, to, to, um, to gender equity as they saw it. I mean... And so there was nothing but downside to free speech in their view. And so what I see again and again on campus is this dynamic in work, at work. And so it has a powerful cultural force that outweighs even the legal force. Thanks to work at Casey and the good folks at ADF and FIRE. By the way, the best thing I ever did for FIRE is to resign and join the Army so Greg Lukianoff could become president. He's fantastic. But... Um, when, you, when, thanks to the good work of FIRE and ADF, we actually have fewer speech codes on college campuses than we have had in a decade. That's the truth. But we don't have a better free speech environment. Why? It's the culture. Who wants to be in the quad surrounded by an angry crowd like the Christakis at Yale because they suggest that adults can make their own decisions about Halloween costumes? Nobody wants that. It takes the rare person who actually relishes that conflict. And so what ends up happening is you have a lot of people of goodwill and good nature and good sense who will remain quiet. Well, but then who speaks? Who speaks? We are just having this conversation. Why is it that student groups are inviting Milo Yiannopoulos to campus? Why are they inviting Richard Spencer to campus? Because what's happening is those people who are choosing to speak, who are not cowed and intimidated, are deciding to erect the double middle finger to campus. That they've decided the alternative to political correctness is, pardon my language, assholery. And that's not actually the case. And that actually does deep damage to free speech as well. Because it makes the social justice argument for the social justice warrior. Because they say, what I am doing is standing as a bulwark against this monster. And so it creates this false dichotomy that it is political correctness or racism. It's political correctness or vicious hatred and trolling. And that they're the bulwark against that kind of viciousness. And so it, that, it, it eats like a cancer. That social shaming eats like a cancer at the very, at, at the very nature of free speech on both directions. One, it silences the good it silences the norm, the moderate. It silences the normal person, and perversely empowers often the worst. And that's what we're seeing on college campuses from coast to coast. And those are all really good points, um, but that raises the question: If it's a cultural issue, what do you do about it? If it's on college campuses, I know you've written that. Well, the federal government um, could ha have a role in trying to enforce uh, First Amendment on public college campuses. Um, but if this is an issue in our, our culture in general and the polarization that you're discussing, which we're certainly seeing in cable news, social media, what do we do about it? Can, can I just pose a question? Why, and I'm really, this is really just for my own sort of analytic clarity. Why is it not a problem when Josh Hochschild has to resign from Wheaton College because he's become a Catholic? 
Can I answer that? Yeah. Okay. So and I'm not saying it is. I just want to know yeah. why it's not. So so here here's I draw a distinction between different kinds of universities right. because private universities also possess their own academic freedom and their own free speech rights. Okay. They have they sure. have their First Amendment rights possessing entities as well. So I draw a distinction and, and this allows me to defend William F. Buckley after your vicious assault. <laughs> no. Um, so I, I, I have you read Gone in India? Yeah, yeah, of course. Oh, well, I, I mean, I'm often in the rooms with people who quote I, it, but have never read it. So that's, that's great that you have. I work at National Review. I mean, if, if I don't, oh, it's well, so you have to say you do. I mean, well, we know her story. Of course, say, I, of course, of course, I have. Um, so I think that uh, there are account, and Fire actually makes this distinction, and I think does it very well. Public universities are bound by law to protect uh, constitutional rights. There are private universities who are bound by their own promises to protect uh, academic freedom. Yale is a, a Yale, Harvard, your major private universities, as a general rule, put themselves out to the public, not as the Bob Jones of the left, but as research universities engaged in open inquiry. Then there are a small subcategory of Christian colleges, uh, many small Catholic universities, colleges like Wheaton that exist for a very particular purpose. And that very particular purpose is to train and equip evangelical or Catholic students in not just in psychology and biology, but also in their faith. And see, what I would argue is, and by the way, I legally speak, I don't think any of us disagree with any of this, right? I mean, Bob Jones absolutely has the right to be Bob Jones. Wheaton has the right to be Wheaton. Oberlin has the right to be Oberlin, right? These are private schools, right? I'm just saying, if we agree here that human flourishing for our 18 to 22 year olds involves encountering radical different views that discomfort us all the time, radical, that kind of flourishing isn't different if you grew up in a Christian household and choose an evangelical college. But we don't agree on that. Okay. Yeah, so, so, what if, so, so let me posit this. Oberlin has chosen, they don't say it in their mission. They've chosen to be the left-wing Bob Jones. Which is why I leave Oberlin alone. And kids go there because they want that. Now, I don't want my kids to go to Oberlin or Bob Jones, mm -hmm. but each of them is being true to the culture that they that everyone pretty much knows they have. But government, the, the the government, government, sorry, wait. Just to say, uh, but government has a role in here. Oberlin, as a private university, enjoys enormous tax benefits as a private university. We can legitimately ask, legitimately ask ourselves whether the federal government has an interest in sponsoring a university which is which passionately seeks to shut down a wide range of opinions. It doesn't just, it's not just up for grabs. If, if Oberlin University wants to say, we no longer are interested in federal funds, I agree with you. It's a completely private organization. It's free to do what it wishes to do. But so, so long as it depends on the federal government, it becomes a political question. We should ask whether we want to continue to fund that. We might even ask, for example, might even wonder, for example, whether the federal government shouldn't condition fed the continuation of federal funds to private universities on their upholding the First Amendment. Since we, since we have, a, po uh, a political, I would argue, a political interest in universities that do just that. I agree. I think that's a pretty thin read to hang what we agree is an important thing. You agree or you think it's a thin read? I, well, <laughs> I, I, agree that, I agree that about your interpretation of the law, except I'd point out, of course, look at where that could go, right? Because Bob Jones is pretty unique. There are some other Christian schools that take no government money, but most Christian schools take some, if only in the forms of Pell Grants that they get, that pass through the students. See, yeah, I know. Right? I mean, if you go down that road of really meddling that way, a lot of Christian schools could get undone in their mission. And you know, I, I don't. How, and how much government money is you mean in the, the scientists there take NSF grants? Christian universities are talking about a, a small number. There's a tremendous right. disproportion. What you're suggesting, of course, small Christian colleges raise issues. But the kinds of issues that we're talking about generally are pervasive throughout the country. Yeah. We're talking about liberal education in thousands of universities around the country that's under assault. Well, one can come up with examples of the failure to defend this progressive or this left winger, but that's not the dominant problem in the United not right States. Now. Not. As you, well, as you yourself pointed out, this isn't the 1950s. This no. isn't but, state le but state legislatures are often meddling and or or insinuating that they'll meddle with uh, with the state school. I mean, the state I, legislatures we, are more conservative, and fire documents uh, this. Well, do you have an example but of the I state legislature? I just want to bring Casey in here for a second. No, not Casey. <laughs> he only runs for a sponsor. He's a so I just wanted to ask him about some of the, uh, the cases that, uh, or some recent cases of the Queen's sure. College case. 
um, the case at Iowa State. And uh, what we're seeing is that the colleges are promulgating these ostensibly content neutral policies such as uniform codes, solicitation policies, free speech zones um, that are being disparately uh, applied. And I want to know, uh, Tell me a little more about those cases. How do you go about, you know, filing a lawsuit? And how do you argue uh, that there are constitutional violations? You know, and this is most of the situations that we deal with uh, tend to be situations where the policies on their face, uh, they're not viewpoint discriminatory policies, right? There's nothing in the policy that says uh, that conservative speakers aren't going to be allowed or conservative student groups are not going to be permitted or anything of that sort. Uh, usually what they are, they're policies that allow that to happen uh, behind closed doors typically. So actually, a really good example of that uh, happened right here in New York City, Queens College uh, in New York City, as, uh, as Carrie mentioned earlier. And we actually had Norvelia here. If you want to raise your hand so people can find you later. Norvelia is one of my favorite people, so make sure to uh, talk to Norvelia later. Um, Norvelia is uh, uh, the leader of the Queens College Students for Life group. Policies at Queens College, this is just, just give you a the, an example of what this really looks like in real life. Um, she goes and applies to become a student group at Queens College. They didn't have a, uh, a regular pro-life presence of any kind at Queens College, so big school needs to at least have a pro-life voice. So she goes in to start a, a Students for Life group, and basically the rule at Queens College is if you want to start a student organization, then you fill out all this paperwork, uh, you go and do a presentation, and then we'll get back to you. And that was basically the rule. Uh, a panel of students that were student government just sort of quietly behind closed doors make an, an up or down vote on whether or not you're approved as a student organization or not. And so what that allows is essentially exactly what happened. Uh, for no reason at all, as a matter of fact, they wouldn't tell her the reason why. Why are you not approving us as a student group? Silence. Uh, they decided that they would not allow them to be approved. And what that means is not just that you don't get to be you know, formally approved as a student organization, it means you can't reserve meeting space, you can't invite speakers in, uh, the whole panoply of what it means to actually have a voice on your campus you're basically excluded from uh, at, at Queens College. So we filed a lawsuit there. Um, you mentioned uh, some of these other situations like Iowa State, for example. We took out one of the, the worst speech codes in the country this past year at, at Iowa State. Uh, we distinguish between speech codes and speech, speech zones are basically the rules. Here's where you're allowed to speak, here's where you're not allowed to speak. Speech codes are more, um, what are you allowed to say and what are you not allowed to say? Iowa State, big school, right? Big school that should have general counsel that is employed and knows how to manage a, uh, you know, a student code of conduct and figure out these policies. Iowa State's policy said that uh, the way they defined harassment and you could be expelled from the school for violating this policy was uh, First Amendment protected expression may be harassment depending on the circumstances. <laughs> so of course, the, the administration of the school gets to decide. So you go speak, you, do, you say whatever you want to say, and we'll let you know later whether or not it was protected or we've decided to kick you out of the school. That's not a policy at all, right? I mean, there's, they would have been better off to just not even bother with trying to put down a policy on paper at that point. Um, so we sued them, uh, and of course one of the, the rules at Iowa State was they required everyone at the beginning of the year to sign on a, a piece of paper saying that you would comply with all policies, uh, with, with this particular policy at Iowa State, um, which, you know, how, how can you say in advance, I promise that I will comply with the policy that you'll tell me later what it means. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's what it looks like in real life. These are the sorts of policies we, we see uh, coming up for students. And they not only are applied in ways that deny students' ability to speak, um, you know, these students, you arrive on campus your first year and you're handed your 100-page student code of conduct. And that's how you learn what it's, this is your first opportunity to have actually interacted with the government in an ongoing way, right? You dealt with uh, the, uh, you know, the DMV or something when you're 16. Other than that, you're now learning to live with government officials on a daily basis and you get this long list of policies that you have to comply with. And so what we're seeing is these universities uh, basically telling students, this is what it's like uh, to exist as a citizen in this democracy, is you have this long list of things that tell you where you can speak, where, you, where you're not allowed to speak, what you're allowed to say, and what you're not allowed to say. I, I, that 
it concerns me that we have those kinds of that kind of training for the next generation uh, as as they develop and learn how to be citizens. So. I just wanted to steer the conversation back to the the topic of tonight, which is freedom's marketplace. Uh, you guys uh, were discussing about what is government's role um, in enforcing uh, free speech or free speech rights. I was wondering. What about market pressures? Is there any hope that market pressures could steer students toward more free colleges? Um, or is the public demand for uh, speech restrictions and safe spaces um, greater than there is for free speech? Just opening up to the, the panel. I, I would say the market pressure is a price pressure that's going to drive more students online. Um, I mean, Liberty University, for example, um, years ago was the sleepy little Christian college in Lynchburg, Virginia. Now it's an online titan powerhouse. I mean, I think it's got about, what, five or 6,000 students on campus and 50 million online. I mean, it's uh, more than 100,000, I think, online. And I, I think that that's going to be a market change that we're going to see. What that will do for free speech, though, I think is going to be... I, I'm going to say a net negative, and the reason I'm going to say it is because I think that the interaction online is far more transactional than it is uh, focused around an exchange of ideas. Uh, it's far more here is the lesson, here is the test, uh, and you're losing inevitably a lot of the free exchange that ideally your better campus ex experiences are going to have. And I think that's a market pressure that will actually do something maybe about the concept of uh, the kind of indoctrination you see on campus, but I don't know that it's going to do anything constructive about building the culture of free speech and free exchange. If I could add to that, um, there's a story that uh, Tom Wolf tells, which, which brings out the peculiarity of the market that higher education represents, especially elite higher education. Wolf was, Wolf was recalling this in the late 90s, early 2000s. He was saying, I've been living in the city, New York City, 30 or 40 years, given many talks and had been to many dinner parties with parents. He says, it's amazing. From early on, all the parents in Manhattan want is to get their little children into Harvard College. He said, and yet, in all my years in speaking to parents of children, in New York City, I haven't once heard a parent express any interest in actually the quality of education offered at Harvard University. <laughs> in other words, so long as parents aren't primary parents who are footing the bill aren't primarily interested in the quality of education, but instead are interested in the social networks and the credential, you can't expect this imperfect market. You can't expect students who, after all, are over me. 17, 18, or 19 to exert pressure. They want to graduate. You're not going to get pressure from professors and administrators. They're a big part of the problem. Where is their leverage? In one place there is some le leverage. We're talking about market, market forces. That, that means non-governmental choices. Wealthy alums. It's still, it's true. It remains true today that something like the third of the price of an undergraduate education is still paid for. By, by wealthy donors. They have some leverage over, uh, over American universities. At elite, at elite colleges. At elite colleges, right? yes. Um, yeah, another way of, you're right, and I won't, I won't take it back with the other hand this time. <laughs> I'll just say another way of saying that is higher education is a massive market failure. Unless what you're buying is credentialing, right? Yeah. I mean, as somebody who was very expensively educated um, at private school, at New England private school and then at Yale, um, I can tell you that some of the, my friends who went to small, cheaper colleges or who got state, state uh, school educations that were, you know, where the cost was defrayed, though not entirely covered by the state of Connecticut or Massachusetts or North Carolina, have educations just as good as mine. They didn't purchase quite as much status or um, job market viability, right? Which I then promptly threw out the window by becoming a journalist. But, it's, but you know, if I'd wanted a lucrative career doing something in the lucrative arts, um, then my Yale education was probably worth every dollar. 
But if what you want is robust intellectual dialogue or discourse, it's a massive market failure because what 18-year-olds are selecting for, even at places like Yale and Harvard and Swarthmore, is the latest dorms, they need Wi-Fi, the squash courts have to be rebuilt every 10 years. Um, the, uh, the alumni at these schools have their own agendas, as Mr. Buckley knew, which is they want the schools to look exactly like the school they graduated from. As a 42-year-old who just had his 20th reunion, I can tell you I am absolutely prey to this exact impulse. <laughs> There's no question in my mind but that Yale College peaked in every sense. It, it, intellectually, athletically, um, aesthetically, we were better looking in 1996. May 1996 was the single best one because it's when I was a senior, and it's what I remember, right? And that's the way alumni think of things. We are always upset by any change. So we are, we're very poor stewards of universities, right? Um, conservatives think we're good stewards of universities because we're more conservative than undergrads. But we actually don't know undergrads. We have no particular interest in them except as replicating the experience we've had. So what this means is that the kind of pressure we need, and this goes back to the, the conversation, the back and forth we're having before, is real cultural pressure coming from parents and families and each other saying, all of us should want to be confronted with ideas that discomfort us. And that has to be true whether you go to West Point or Wheaton or Yale or Swarthmore or UMass. We all have to have that vigorous desire. And I don't feel like any of us is doing a good enough job of inculcating it. That's the only pressure we have. I think, you know, Parents are not looking for places where their children are going to be challenged. They're looking for, for places where their children are going to be safe, generally speaking, um, and the credential. And so um, it's the, the opposite instinct, if anything, right? You're not looking for the place where someone is, that, that's, not the, that's not the goal. I, I do think there is a kind of market failure inside the market failure here in that um, there is, it is difficult to know. Um, it's difficult to compare one school to another school from a sort of holistic free speech environment. You can know about individual events, right? If, if someone is asking me right now, should I send my child to Cal State University of Los Angeles? The first thing that, mm -hmm. in top of my mind would be the Ben Shapiro incident, and I would probably say no, because see Ben Shapiro case, right? But I really don't know overall how it compares to one of the other Cal State system schools. Um, it may be that it's not nearly as bad as some other Cal State school, and you know, someone is, so there is a failure there um, of, of information. We have some tools that we're hoping to launch pretty soon that will we'll try to help with that. Um, but you know, ultimately it has to be, those only help to the degree that the, the kids and the parents are actually interested in where's a place that I can speak freely? What's a school that is actually respecting my rights to be able to speak freely? And this also, okay, I just want to, this also has a cultural component, which is Americans think of college as four more years of protected childhood. Now, the French don't think that way. When you go off the University of Paris or the Sorbonne, you don't move on to campus and join a fraternity or sorority and join an intramural sports team. You, you, know, you get an apartment in, in town and you register for classes and you lead a life as a Parisian. Um, you know, Israel, where I know you, is pretty similar. I mean, for, they're, they're older, they've done army already. There's not the same sense that it's four more years of, that it's four years of doubling down on childhood because you can party and your parents. But there's a collusion between the kids and the parents in America, which is, the kids want to be kids for four more years because, hey, consequence-free partying. And the parents want them to be kids for four more years because maybe it's four more years when you can, when they will still stay like you. When if they're Christian, they'll stay Christian. When if they're Jewish, they'll stay Jewish. When if they're conservative, when if they're liberal, you send them off to Oberlin or Swarth, they'll stay liberal. And they won't really divert, and they'll still text you five times a day. And it's a collusion to keep them from being grown-ups. And I think that's very American, and it cuts across politics. Uh, just piggybacking on that, I think the last question for me, and then we need to open it up to the audience, um, is the role of K through 12 education, public schools, which is the big elephant in the room, I think. Um, what role do they have in helping <coughs> values of free speech, and are they failing in their mission? Their job? That's a great question, because Kids do not arrive at a Harvard or at Yale or any of these other schools where free speech challenges are happening loving free speech until they have their first freshman class. And their scales from their eyes fall from their eyes and they embrace intersectionality and, and uh, <clears throat> understand you know, that speech is violence and are totally against dead naming and all of the other buzzwords that exist today. Kids are being formed K through 12, particularly in the better K through better K through 12 schools, 
and they are being prepared to go to college and to become, in many cases, the social justice warriors that we see. And conversely, a lot of the more sensible, more moderate, more reasonable students, and many of the conservative students are getting that exact same training, often to keep their head down, not to speak, just to push through, just to get through. And I think this goes back to the question that you asked about culture. Uh, what can we do about this? Well, one of the things that I think as parents, and I'm a parent of an 18-year-old who's fixing to go to college, 16-year-old and a 9-year-old, and, and I learned early on, I, I was um, fond of the phrase that Ravi Zacharias, who some of you are familiar with, uses, that it comes in the battle of ideas, stigma tends to defeat dogma. In other words, uh, attacks, uh, personal attacks, condescension, <coughs> mockery, threats, tend to defeat ideas because people will be quiet, people will not speak. So one of the things I think is very important as parents, as educators, is teaching students courage. Just the small amount of courage that it takes to speak. Because the, there's one thing that I found in this polarized campus environment in my years there, both teaching and, and uh, as a student, it doesn't take that much dissent to break up the mob mentality. It really doesn't. Uh, and, and so that, but that's what we're often lacking. You know, I would be in a room full of 135 students, and I would be the only one raising my hand and articulating a basic conservative point of view, but I would be able to call out, you, you, you. I could know who else agreed with me and wouldn't say a word. And had two, three, four other people raise their voice, it would have changed the di entire dynamic of the classroom. And that's one thing we're lacking, and they're being trained that from K through 12, where they're being trained into timidity from K through 12. If I can elaborate on the generational point, uh, I think that's right. Your successor, Greg Lukianoff, uh, makes the following observation. <coughs> he's been president, or he's been at FIRE for 15 years. He says that up until a few years ago, when he came to campus to defend freedom of speech and due process, he could always count on the students taking fireside against faculty and administration. But he reports that over the last year or two, that's no longer true. The students are now lining up with faculty and administration against freedom of speech. How do we explain that? Well, here's a modest explanation. Our universities, one could date it back to the 60s, if I go back to the late 1980s, early 1990s, the universities have been teaching this doctrine that speech is a form of violence. They've been teaching in the law schools, they've been teaching in political science departments, they've been teaching it in literature departments. Our students in K through 12 are now, have been being educated for the last 15 years by men and women who learned at universities in the mid 1980s, late 80s, early 90s to understand speech as violence, to believe that offensive speech was speech that needs to be closed down. So uh, I'm all with David that we should, teach, uh, we should teach young men and women courage, but we need to understand how deeply entrenched the ideology hostile to free speech is in our universities today. Thanks. I, I think both of, I, I, think, I think that David and Peter are both right about that. Um, it feels a little bit removed from my children's educational experience. I, my children are 10, 8, 6, and 3. And three of them you know, are in public school right now. The three-year-old, uh, we've not skipped her two grades into kindergarten, but <laughs> well, she's, she's home. She's in nursery school two days a week, and otherwise home with me or my wife. Um, you know, their school is not politicized in any way, shape, or form. It's it's a K through eight school that is constantly suffering cutbacks because we're a poor city and we do education by property tax in this country. And so the paras who used to be in the first and second grade now you only have a para profession in kindergarten. And uh, we've held the line at 26 students per class, but my wife grew up in New York City, graduate of Stuyvesant High School, where there were 35 kids per class, and of course that's a remarkably good high school. Um, you know, the facts on the ground of, of K through 8 in New Haven are just a lot of very hardworking educators doing their best to, to teach children how to read, some of whom are not getting it at home. Um, and I guess I would say that if the, only, the only caveat I'd put or the complication put to, to what you two gentlemen said is that there's a, there's a kind of elite educate, you're, you're, that's true in places where the teachers have gone to Bank Street or Columbia Teachers College. I don't know how politicized 
the education certificates that my daughters, I have four girls, that their teachers got when they got certified to teach at Southern Connecticut State University or University of New Haven or Fairfield University were. I think that, um, you know, and I imagine that if you go out into the heartland, most teachers are getting certified at the state college that has the education program. And I think that those are much more unchanged from 10 years ago or 20 years or 30 years, for better and for worse. Um, I could be wrong about that, but I can only tell you that's my view from, from urban New Haven. No, I'll, no. I'm, are you good? I'm good with opening it right. up, so yeah. All right, let's open it up to the okay. Hi, um, I have two unrelated questions. Um, the first wait, is... Wait, wait. Oh, <laughs> thanks. Hello? Um, yeah. I have two unrelated questions. Um, the first is, do you think that the confirmation bias uh, propagated by um, certain algorithms on social media uh, constitute uh, a suppression <laughs> of free speech? Um, uh, why and why not? And, and the second is, um, do you think that uh, the debate we're having is, um, is contradictory to, to being sensitive to uh, the visceral reactions of uh, minority groups on these campuses. Um, something that, that I've thought about is, you know, we're, we're just talking about ideas, but there are uh, marginalized groups who have visceral reactions to those ideas. And do you think that that deserves uh, an empathic response? Okay, so I'm gonna start because I first have to say that um, there was once a time when Facebook was uh, was just starting, and uh, actually particularly Twitter. And I remember David French telling us um, that this was all just a giant waste of time, no one should do any social media stuff. Um, and then like six months later, he was all over the place. And, was, you know, um, and, you know, nearly, that nearly became president of Twitter or something. So, um, no, I, so it's not, I don't, it's not a free speech violation. Um, it is, it's, this is much like the conversation we were having about public universities, private universities. You know, um, Zuckerberg can do what Zuckerberg wants to do. Um, he can create his private company that manipulates uh, what is on my Facebook feed. He's, he's free to do that. The First Amendment doesn't say anything about it. There is, however, I don't think there's any way to deny that it's a, it's a perfect example of the kind of uh, uh, self-isolation um, it, and maybe in this case, it's sort of helped along isolation that we have. Social media is a big problem in that way. Um, you know, you, you, the, the people you follow, and I'm, I'm you know, as, as bad an offender as anybody else. I end up following people that I want to follow because I agree with what they have to say. And so I start following those people, and I see a lot of things that repeat the same things that I believe over and over and over again. And I start to believe the things I believe more and more and more. And you have to step back from it and realize. Uh, just sort of what you're taking in. But, you know, I think if, to me, one thing that we learned out of 2016 um, is that we are, uh, we're an entire country of people that is walling ourselves off uh, from information that we don't want to hear. And I, surrounding ourselves with voices we want to hear, and that has some serious consequences going forward for, uh, for the country. So can, I make I a, can I make a book recommendation? Uh, Tyler Cowen's The Complacent Class, just written, and he's talking about how one of the things that he talks about is how this technological universe that was supposed to bring the world to us uh, and to introduce us to cultures and ideas and thoughts that we never would have encountered in like small town Columbia, Tennessee, where I live, has in fact been engineered and turned into something called that's much more focused on what he termed matching. In other words, it's matching you with what you like. Hmm. And that's what Facebook does. Twitter less, Twitter's just sewer. So it's just matched. Twitter has matched people with those who like sewage. But um, I've so, heard the argument before that that uh, Twitter is where you go to find out that everyone in the world are jerks. Facebook is where you go to find out that all of your friends and family are jerks. <laughs> so uh, so that matching this is being live streamed on Facebook. So. Yeah. That matching phenomenon is, is furthering that law of group polarization. And then one thing that you, that you said I think is really, really important about visceral reactions to speech that people might have 
uh, for example, members of historically marginalized communities. When I speak, I have a responsibility, particularly as a Christian, to speak the truth with a measure of grace. I am not trying to intentionally inflame or, or hurt or anger anybody when I speak. However, the fact that somebody might be hurt or inflamed might just be their problem, and it might just be their fault. And one of the things that we can't say is that the mere fact that someone is offended means that the offender is at fault. It is often the person who is offended who is at fault. And it often, because our culture incentivizes taking offense and gives power to those who are offended, sometimes the offense is not necessarily in good faith even. It's a very convenient, it's a very knee-jerk reaction. How do I know this? One of the ways that you know this is you will note that over the last 10, 15, 20 years, the things that people find really offensive tend to change and morph uh, according to political trends and currents. These are things that are not necessarily inherently offensive, but they are things that empower the offended. And, and that's something that I think uh, an awful lot of people uh, number one, just need to get tougher. They just need to get tougher. I remember a case I had at fire where a kid was thrown out of the dorm and forced to live. He's a poor kid in New Hampshire, forced to live in his car in the dorm parking lot. And here's why. He had gotten tired of people taking an elevator uh, when they only lived on the second or third floor. So he said, if you want to lose the freshman 15, take the stairs instead of the elevator. And he put that sign up. And that was deemed to be weight shaming and fat shaming. And I, it was clearly just a joke. You know, and so I get a call from the, uh, the um, student newspaper there. And he said, what is your message to women who are struggling with the freshman 15? Like the president of fire has to have a message to them <laughs> struggling with the freshman. I said, my message is cowboy up. Because life gets a lot tougher than this. And we have to teach people not to be too weak to live with freedom. So I, I wrote a piece in the Los Angeles Times this morning. David and I both wrote pieces about the same thing today or yesterday, <laughs> which is uh, this incident at, of, of a professor at Rhodes College who wrote an article for Hypatia, which is a feminist journal. Raise your hands if you've heard of this. The, the, there we go. Okay. But you haven't yet, but you will because you'll read our stuff. Yeah. But, um, and she was attacked. Basically, she was roughly speaking. I'm going to get this slightly wrong. She was equating um, transgender issues trans issues with transracial issues. She looked at the, the person of Rachel Dolezal, and then she looked at people who were sexually trans, and she was drawing philosophical, abstruse analytic philosophical analogies, and she was just pilloried by, and she's a leftist, but she was pilloried by people farther to her left who said that the mere analogy did violence and harm to trans uh, men and women. Okay, now, so I wrote my, we both wrote about this, and I began my piece by saying, look, I'm a Jew who has spent days in the company of Holocaust deniers. I was once sent to rural Southern California, actually not so rural, but suburban Southern California, and to meet with Bradley Smith and Mark Weber, who thankfully are names nobody really knows anymore, but if you've worked in the free speech community, you had to deal with them at one point because they are big mockers in the Holocaust denial and anti-Semitic communities. And there I was spending like several days interviewing them and having them look at me and tell me all the reasons that my people either wasn't the victims of genocide or was the victims but exaggerated grossly to accumulate world power or was just perfidious or, I mean, the worst sort of stuff coming from someone who, people who are, are anti-Semites to someone whose community actually has been the victims of real genocide, like the actual shoved into gas chambers kind of genocide. Now, if anyone was going to be traumatized by it, if ever there was an instance where you'd think I'd be traumatized and harmed, this might have been it. And it was creepy. I'm not going to say it wasn't creepy. But what I said was, you know, part of the catharsis of talking with people, of the fact that in America they are reduced to just talking to me, <laughs> and that I get to talk back to them and say, well, that seems pretty silly. Um, and then you, go, you fly home and you hug your spouse and you pet your dog and life goes on. It was actually very empowering. So, and I want for my children that some kind of grit, that kind of resilience, even when they encounter things that are very, very upsetting. Now, I don't deny that there are some people who have been through experiences that, if reminded of them, will be 
really re-traumatizing. I think that exists in the world. It certainly exists among veterans, for example, right? And those people have to be careful about what they step into. But that's a minority of the people who are claiming harm, trauma, et cetera, on campus. And I think we have to incentivize people to, to we have to talk up the virtues of encountering dissent as an empowering, rewarding thing, rather than rewarding people who claim harm. I do want to say that we all need to be more Christian toward people who claim they've been harmed. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you said there's no idea so stupid that radical feminists won't adopt it, or what, I mean, is calling people stupid the Christian thing to do? Wait, that wasn't my quote. I have your quote. Yeah, my quote was right. There's no argument that is too stupid for argument that is too stupid. Okay. Yes. There's no lie that these scholars aren't willing to tell. I mean. They, did you, you might be right. Uh, yes. I think we have really good time. <laughs> but that was for you and me. But my point is just yeah, we have to be. Fair. That was, so, so here's. We have to model charity in all okay. of our relations. <laughs> that was exactly I'm, right, I'm, by the way. I'm a uh, pastor, podcaster, and a friend of Mark's. Uh, and I went to an evangelical college. But first, David, I just want to say one thing. Um, I wonder if there is a Christian role for the, it's the 500th year anniversary of the Reformation, if there's a place for <laughs> imputation. You know, Martin, it, Martin Luther kind of brought this to the forefront that, that what God does with us is imputes positive motives, like sees us in our best light. So I wonder, you know, when you talked about offense, you know, a lot of times the person offended is, is you know, the one that, that is attempting to manipulate the situation yeah. to look, tame power. I wonder what it looks yeah. like to practice a kind of Protestant evangelical imputation and see them in their best light. And the other thing I just wanted to ask is how much of, kind of piggybacking off some things Mark said earlier on, if we really want a, a culture of free speech and discourse, how much, I mean, everybody feels like exiles in this culture. If you're a gun rights person, you feel like the NRA's. It, you know, you feel like the gun uh, restriction people are taking over. If you're, if you want gun protections, you feel like the NRA runs the thing. If you're liberal, you feel like we're in a right wing takeover. If you're conservative, you know, socialists are running. And so, on some level, I, it doesn't matter, right? I mean, rights matter. But on some level, the civil society <laughs> is what we need to cultivate, and and, and it, we ought to be. I mean, how do we? I, it, it seems like I, that we are quick to defend rights, kind of what you were saying, Mark, not to just parrot you, but, you know, I wonder at one point, especially people in Christian communities, aren't, aren't we ought we to be seeking the shalom <laughs> of the city with all its diversity uh, and, 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 and being um, uh, long-suffering and patient. Do you want to uh, respond to that? In, in a way, the formula is simple, and it goes back to the previous question. We need to educate young men and women to, in conversation, education, be kind, courteous, and civil, do their best to understand other people's views. And we must make perfectly clear that the fact that somebody feels harmed by an opinion, a speech, a point of view, is simply no grounds for silencing it. Now, that's the formula, very simple actually executing it in the complexities of 2007, an enormous challenge. All right, we have one question for one more, one more question. Um, I saw this man in front uh, raise his hand early, preemptively. Uh, it's, uh, Tony Carnes. I'm, my name's Tony Carnes, I'm with the Journey Through NYC Religions. A uh, very diverse place, but uh, in universities it's not so diverse here. I've heard that, well, we need a cultural change, uh, the topic is that we need a, a marketplace of ideas, but it doesn't seem like there's a marketplace of ideas in the university, so uh, it seems like it's more you need trust busting, a structural change. <laughs> uh, Teddy Roosevelt did create a change by saying, well, we're going to have them be more polite or more cultured or uh, something like that. He said we have to go in and bust up the structure. So I want to sort of push back at the framework that we have. What is the right framework for understanding the university and the cultivation of uh, free speech. I was actually just thinking of David's piece. If you wanted to speak about the uh, your your marketplace of ideas piece recently about the uh, the misnomer of the marketplace, the uh, university as the or actually the free speech movement um, and the, uh, the Berkeley. Uh, 
and I can quote it for you. You've written so many pieces since then. Yeah, no, no, go ahead. <laughs> I, I would I would just say that there's you know, there's a demand problem which is which is our faculties are not demanding enough conservatives to teach. I'm getting really into the nitty gritty of how do you, how would you change the university? How would you trust plus certain trusts? There's also a supply problem. The conservative students I teach think it's much more interesting to go make money on Wall Street than to get PhDs in German literature. Uh, if to the extent I meet a student who decides they want to get a PhD in the humanities, it's almost always a liberal student, and it's not because they think that's the venue to practice their social justice warrioring. And the conservatives aren't fleeing because they've heard. The job market is particularly bad for conservatives. Generally, it's they've because, all heard that. sorry? They've all heard that, too. I, when I talk to these students, they say, why are you doing what you're doing next year? They're coming from cultural differences. I mean, they're- The recruitment is very narrow. Re there's no they recruitment. That there's, no, there's no recruitment. The recruitment's a mess. But it's also, there are cultural differences, which is that, look, everyone I knew growing up with in lefty Western Massachusetts, all the parents thought it'd be terrific if we became underpaid professors. Mm. That was the culture. So, and I, I wish more conservative students of mine wanted to be journalists. I wish more wanted to be uh, professors. It is harder to push them into it. A piece of that is that they've heard they'll be discriminated against, but that's not the only part of it. And I think so it's, that, <coughs> it's also, though, to some degree, as you have no models. I mean, the, if, you're, if you're a student on the right and you decide you want to become a, uh, you want to pursue a career in academia, you look around for the, uh, the clearly conservative, so let me, because right and left, conservative liberal is, is, is almost meaningless um, at this point. If you are the, uh, the social justice warrior uh, who wants to pursue sort of a, a more radical feminism approach and that's your, your academic path, if you're that student on a university campus, you have your choice of people who you already know are completely in agreement with your worldview and are probably somehow still to your left. And you can go talk to them and figure out you know, how do I get that other, you know, one more level uh, further to the extreme uh, that I'm not quite at yet. If you are the evangelical Christian student who says, I would like to, uh, you know, to, to be an academic, you try to figure out who is my model on campus, and they, you don't know who they are. And they're probably someone we were discussing before, to the extent they exist, they're probably pretty quiet, and they're, in, they're a structural engineer or something that has nothing to do with anything that could get them in trouble, right? They can they can do their thing over there, they're dealing with numbers, and no one is going to cause any problems. So I think the structural problem ends up being a lack of models, and I think that actually ends up contributing to some of the problems we see, uh, some of the, the, the dynamics we were talking about earlier, um, where you know conservative students, some of the speakers that they're bringing in, and some of the problems they're having, they don't have great models on campus. For they won't get how do you tenure. Do? Well, that's yeah. exactly right. Right. Peter, just right. Yeah, I, actually, I don't agree with Mark's suggestion that we need to uh, uh, we need to seek out more conservatives uh, on campus or, or for our faculties. There was a study. Harvard did a study six or seven years ago in the humanities, and they discovered that fully half of the students who matriculated at Harvard College. Uh, and it said they wanted to study humanities, dropped out of the humanities by the end of the first year. Why did they drop out of the humanities? The evidence is not because they were seeking jobs on Wall Street. It's because the humanities are so laden with jargon, so heavily politicized, that they drive students away to the social sciences and other studies. What we need above all, if we're going to undertake any reform, is a recovery of an idea that has been almost entirely lost on our campuses. And that's the idea of what is a liberal education. You know, one, one last thing that I would say. Um, number one, I get law students every year. I speak to law students around the country every year. <laughs> law students will come to me and say, I want to pursue a career in the academy. Is it even worth trying? Is it worth trying? Because if you're going to try in the legal profession to have an academic career, that means making some very conscious and deliberate choices uh, that in, of investing a lot of time, energy, and effort. And there's a number of students who've come to me with sterling credentials who don't even know if it's worth trying. Number two, I want to go back, you didn't really answer um, uh, Mr. Shalom's point uh, back there. <laughs> but I think, you know, one of the problems I have is when we talk about things like, well, don't you want to seek the shalom of the city? I hear that and I often hear that the shalom of the city is not me shutting up. And what you often see on campus is sort of this idea that the peace of the campus depends on the dissenters 
either speaking in the nicest way a human being can speak or just not speaking at all. Whereas the majoritarian view on campus is fully free and often encouraged to vent and rage and to attack and to insult. And, you know, one of the problems that I have is um, I would like to see a commitment to, you talked about imputation, I would like to see a commitment to accuracy. So, for example, during the presidential election, a lot of my liberal friends were very happy with a lot of the columns I was writing about Donald Trump. And some of the things that I said about Donald Trump is I said he lies. And he lies a lot, okay? Some of the things I said were, I said some of the things that he said were, made no sense or were even stupid things to say. Um, and they were. There is virtue in telling the truth. And speaking of this Hypatia example, some of the things, the ideas there that I said were stupid was, for example, the idea that is enacting violence, enacting violence to use the name Bruce Jenner. When Caitlyn Jenner uses the name Bruce Jenner, that it was enacting violence to say that before a transgender person becomes a woman, that they had any male privilege at all at any point in their lives when Bruce Jenner was an Olympic champion on every cereal box in the United States of America. I ate Jenner Wheaties. We all ate Jenner Wheaties. You know, these, these ideas, some of these things do not deserve to be treated with respect. And to the extent that we treat some of these ideas with respect, just as some of the ideas that came from my own tribe, so to speak, are destructive. And that's okay to say. It's entirely okay to say, even if it hurts people's feelings. Okay. Now, uh, I think that that's the difference between trying to intentionally go out and destroy a human being, but attacking ideas, that's discourse. You said one more, one last one? Hi, I'm going to direct this towards Mark, but any of you can answer. Um, my name is Julian. I work at the Charles Koch Institute. Uh, we deal with a lot of backlash. Um, what I think is interesting is that a lot of people are focusing on students' activism for free speech on campuses, but there is obviously a lot of faculty backlash against these students and against conservative ideas. So what do you think would be a best way to incorporate maybe more left-leaning faculty to unite with right-leaning students to promote free speech on campuses? I, you know, I have a very short answer, and maybe, maybe my friends here can... I mean, you're, you're asking this in a, another version of how do we change the culture. I mean, I think there has to be receptivity and goodwill. People, you know, I think it was Michael Sandel, I could be misquote, you might know. I think it was Michael Sandel who said that, was, did, did he say that, um, that, that conserv liberals are always trying to expel heretics and conservatives are always trying to welcome converts? I think that was the line. Um, but, you know, but, but I've certainly seen this to be true. Liberals are always slicing, trying to throw, like, David didn't get thrown out of conservatism for being a never Trumper, mm -hmm. right? He still had a, it's much harder on the, the left is, feels much, feels beleaguered. I know the right feels beleaguered. Everyone feels beleaguered. That's <laughs> it's very, true. Everyone feels beleaguered, right? Um, but you know, so the answer is a few people on the left have to have the courage and try and say we are, we are liberals in favor of free speech. And that that matters, and that ultimately we actually, I actually would make the argument it conduces to liberal goals, like that because as these things are cyclical, and in certain places we will be the ones out of power. On some campuses we're now the ones in power. I don't know if it's thousands of campuses as you said, but on some campuses we are the ones in power, and we shouldn't abuse it because we will be out of power again. Um, I I am always pointing out to my friends on the left the way in which we make those coalitions impossible. I don't often hear from my friends on the right ways, you know, the term social justice warrior, for example, offends every liberal who hears it because they think social justice is a good thing. Yeah. So the idea that there's something negative, that it's always, and you guys love using it. It's a, it, because it's not a, it doesn't sound immediately offensive, right? It's not like using a racial epithet, but you know that it slurs people on the left. And so they will, oh, I can never be with conservatives for five minutes, they don't come Stop using it. Because it, what it says is this thing you hold dear, which is social justice, which may be about Winning real rights that may not, or just winning economic progress for groups that by any metric don't have it, that that's something like to be belittled. And we do that to conservatives all the time. Um, so I would just say like for me, it would be great if I could say to my fellow liberals, we also have conservative partners on the faculty 
who will get our backs as well and who don't belittle our students. I mean, when the conservatives on the faculty are always belittling the protesters, um, that doesn't make, then the liberal faculty feel, well, we at least have to get their backs because they're hurting. Thank you. We need to, in my judgment, we need to speak about this in a different way. As if we've got a big block of liberals on the faculty and a big block of conservatives and they're both behaving no, badly. we don't. This is not the situation. I ask you, I ask you, can you name a university president, a name of a university president who has come out and spoken forcefully on behalf of freedom of speech? Some of you all know about a lawsuit that was filed in uh, early February. John Doe v. Yale involved the freedom of speech uh, question, had to do with a paper about Plato in which the plaintiff um, said that uh, according to Plato's theory, rape was irrational and immoral. And this, this John Doe student was summoned by the Title IX officers for uh, speaking thoughts he should not speak, okay? Where was the Yale faculty to say, this can't be a Yale University? I've never heard of this case. Well, I believe it. I believe it exists. Uh, but uh, nobody uh, told me. Uh, Alicia, Alicia will tell you. That, and I teach that yeah. Alicia will tell you that there's a small newspaper called the Wall Street Journal, which published, which published an article about this a few okay. weeks ago. Okay. We'll confirm this. How many of you knew about this? I mean. Well, the Wall Street no, Journal. Who reads the Wall Street years. Journal? In any case, my, my, my point is. I would have gotten the students. My point is this is not a matter of conservatives being nice to liberals and liberals being nice to conservatives, that's profoundly misleading. This is a matter of the administrators and the dominant numbers of the university faculty either leading an assault on freedom of speech or acquiescing in silence to the assault on free speech. All right. Thank you, love. Uh,